and the lifestyle that I was living. You know, I was a criminal. I was living a criminal lifestyle, even though I was young. You know, and some people may look at the circumstances that I was living under, all the systemic issues as far as the educational system and the poverty and the crime around me. But the fact of the matter is that I made some choices. You know, some of those choices, I almost feel like they weren't choices because I was like forced to make them, but I still made them at the end of the day. Um, I guess I could have kept running, but you know, there was nobody to run to. There was nobody who was saying that violence is wrong, selling drugs is wrong, crime is wrong, dropping out of school is wrong, being a teen mom is wrong. So um, those behaviors were almost like normal for me, but that still doesn't change the fact that I did some very serious things that led me to incarceration. My name is Lashana Etheridge Bay. I grew up in Southeast DC, the same area where we're located now. I went to Hart Junior High School and Blue Senior High School. So some people would consider that like one of the most dangerous areas in Southeast or in DC in general. And um, over time, I just was forced and taught to start fighting back and, and I would run to my dad. My dad would tell me to go back and fight or I would run to my older siblings and my older siblings would make me go back and fight. So over time I just learned that I had to try to protect myself because you just couldn't run every day. At one point it was just fighting, then we started carrying in knives, then we started carrying, we even started, went through a phase where we were carrying baseball bats. Then I started selling drugs and I became, became a teen mom. I had my daughter when I was about 16, I had my son when I was about 18, and then eventually I started carrying guns. And then there was an incident that took place with one of my friends. She got into an altercation with some girls in our neighborhood and she came to get me. And when I got there, it was at a point where I really, at this, at this stage of my life, I didn't go anywhere without a gun because it was just that dangerous from the things I was doing to people, the things that people were doing to me, and the things that were just going on in the overall community. So um, one of the girls came out and they were, it was probably a large group of females, maybe about 10, 15, and a large group of us. And one of the girls swung a baseball bat and I pointed a gun at her arm, and as she raised her arm, she ended up getting hit in the chest. So when she turned to run away, the girl behind her got shot as well with the second bullet. Like, there's no words that you could put on that to actually explain how severe and serious and detrimental that is. Like, that's like the ultimate for me. Um, I've lost friends and siblings to the street, so I know what it's like, you know, for a mother to lose her child. The first thing I thought about is how old my children will be when I was released from prison, if I ever got released. And um, I just calculated their ages. And that was pretty much all I could think about. It, I mean, the severity of the crime that I committed. It, the second the door slammed on me and my system was clear of all of the marijuana I was smoking, I had started smoking PCP. And, you know, I was just removed from that environment. The second the door slammed on me, I knew that, like, something had to give. Like, what have you done? You know, so. It, it didn't take, um, some people talk about their time hit them years down the line or months down the line. It didn't take that for me. It was the instant the door slammed on me. But my process was still a gradual process to change because like I said, I got my GD right away. But at the time, I didn't even understand the magnitude of it. Like, okay, yeah, I'm getting a GD, I'm in prison. What else do you do in prison besides get a GD? But over time, as I started to grow and learn, the more I learned, the more I wanted to learn. The more I grew, the more I wanted to grow. So um, I just really was able to realize my potential. And I don't know if I say the system necessarily did that for me, because those were some choices that I made you know, internally because of my spiritual connection. 
to my high being. If I had to pick one thing, it would probably be converting to Islamism because being a part of that religion taught me to really study myself, you know, get to know myself, my high self and my lower self, establish principles in my life. I needed guidance, obviously, you know, so I'm one of those people that believe that spirituality is important, but for me, religion is important as well because I, I needed to learn how to love instead of hate. I needed to learn how to solve problems on a spiritual level. Based on what I did, I think that I needed to be held accountable for those actions. And yes, I believe that 18 years was sufficient because I always think if it was me, I'm quite sure my mother would have thought that the person should probably serve 18 years at the least. This made me think about this one unit manager when I was um, leaving, when I made parole, and he said to me, he was like, don't take this the wrong way, but you are the type of person that prisons are made for. And like a part of me wanted to be like insulted, like nobody needs to be here, nobody deserves to be here. But I understood what he meant because I was able to make the most out of the experience. I don't think anybody deserves to be, you know, locked in a cage and you don't get out unless somebody lets you out. At the same time, I needed to be removed from that environment that pretty much just damaged my self-esteem, you know, my love for people, you know, made me start to like violence. I needed to be removed from all that in order for me to, you know, develop into the person that God created me to be. So I understood what he meant. And I do believe that there are some people who are serving time that need to be incarcerated, like myself, for example. Obviously, I needed to be incarcerated. But there are a lot of people who are in prison serving lengthy sentences where the punishment doesn't necessarily fit the crime. I think that my family had unrealistic expectations. When I came home, long story short, like um, nobody actually offered me for me to come live with them. So that was the biggest challenge. I did break down and ask one family member at the last minute, and she said no for uh, whatever reason. So I ended up going through a series of transitional houses. So I think that sort of made it worse for me because I kind of felt like, okay, they really wasn't there when I was incarcerated, even though nobody owed me anything. And then I'm home and nobody's really there for me to the extent that I need them. Not saying that they wasn't there, but not to the extent that I needed them to be there. So I kind of felt like it, it was just me, I, me against the world, like I got to do this on my own. And it's ironic because as much as I speak publicly, about my criminal background and about my personal experiences. I've never disclosed my status on campus, like in class or to any of my professors. And I'm still struggling with why that is, but I think that that's the only place where I really feel normal and I really feel like nobody knows who I am, even though my past is not who I am, but I just don't know if it will be the same experience that they knew.